Amen. How about them Broncos? I, I, I know that some of you don't give a rip about football and could care less about the Super Bowl. And some of you rooted against the Broncos because you just didn't like them. And, and some people rooted for the Panthers because they didn't like the Broncos. But I want to I share some, some things about the Broncos that I think are kind of interesting. You know, uh, two years ago when they played Seattle, halftime came uh, and a uh, half a, a good percentage of the Broncos fans left because they just weren't going to stick around for the annihilation. And, and, and so they left. This year, uh, uh, they stayed until the very end of the game. And, and then uh, Bill was sharing with me that he was at the laundromat uh, on Monday, and there was a group of people gathered there to uh, have a rally for the Denver Broncos. And, and in Denver on Tuesday, they had a million people, they estimated, somewhere between 700 thousand and, and a million. And I don't know how, how you get that, but you may be person in square miles or, or something of, of that nature. But a million people gathered together uh, for the rally of the Broncos coming through on a parade. Uh, and the, the, the governor was there and the mayor was there and, they, and everybody was get, gathered together. What did those people have in common? Did they know each other? No. They didn't know each other. Uh, and were, were those same people at the one two years ago? Uh, and they didn't have a rally. So, you, you know, now, uh, today, probably very few people are going to be talking about the Super Bowl and very few people are going to be talking about the Broncos. And it just kind of fades into the, the, the memory uh, onto the pages of history. So they got together, not knowing one another, but they cheered and they, and they supported one another and they had a really good time together. We would call that the fellowship of the Broncos. But the fellowship of the church should be just a little bit different than the world and the fellowship in the world. We gather together here this morning as the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why we have every Sunday to gather together as a family is the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And when we come to this place, the thing that, that we get to know about each other is first our relationship to Jesus Christ. And that's fundamental. So as a church and we have fellowship with one another, you know, Martha Mitchell sang a song one time, it was called Fellowship by the Pound. Uh, because every time that you have a fellowship, the word dinner was associated with it. And so you got together for a fellowship dinner. And depending upon how good a cook she had in the congregation, it truly was fellowship by the pound. So you went, went home and dieted on Monday but to get past the, the tonnage that you had gained on Sunday. So in looking at our relationship to one another, Jesus Christ has to be the center of my life and your life. Now, a lot of things can change uh, in, in church life. You can get to the place to where your focus is upon another person, uh, per, focuses on a program, focuses upon the things that are going your way, uh, you're involved in a ministry. But it, well, all of us have to have that relationship to Jesus Christ to be a church. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 4 through 9, it says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in, in everything for him or by him in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, every Sunday when we get together and we, we take the Lord's Supper together, the focus has to be upon Jesus Christ and our fellowship relationship to him. Now, the Broncos fans gathered together. There's one million or so of them down there in Denver. And, and the really cool part of it was there's no rioting. There was no looting. There was... No cars overturned, and, and it didn't get ugly. Uh, so, so they, they kind of exonerated uh, the Denver Broncos as the a model fans for the rest of the country to follow after. But they won't have a relationship to one another now until next year. 
and maybe not next year, depending upon how the Denver Broncos go and, and that sort of thing. They may never have a relationship to one another again. But the reason that they do have a relationship to one another is because the Broncos won. We have a relationship to one another because Jesus Christ won on the cross of Calvary. He died, he was risen from the dead, and he lives now. And because of that, you and I have a relationship that's going to continue to grow and grow. Fellowship, a better way to put it is to have in common. What I have in common with you uh, and what you have in common with me is not the way we dress, not the way that we look, not the way that we think, and not the way that we feel, but Jesus Christ is what we have in common. And because we have a relationship to Jesus Christ, then that means that you and I get to have a relationship to one another, which we'll talk more as we go through here. Book of Galatians, third chapter, verse 26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Christ Jesus then is the way that you and I can come into a relationship to God. So, so if we look and understand Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they walked with God. They had fellowship with God. We were created for fellowship with God. And they were created for fellowship with one another. So in the garden, Eve decided that she wanted to eat something she wasn't supposed to. And then she suggested to her husband he'd do the same thing. Of course, he jumped right in there and he, and he did it. And then God said, you have lost fellowship with me. And he pushed them out of the garden and closed the door, closed the gate, so that they could never get back into a fellowship relationship to God, what we were created for. And so what he, what he very plainly says is that the way that you come back into a relationship to God is through Jesus Christ. Now, how could that be? Since we still have sin in our life, Adam and Eve were separated from God because of sin in their life. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And when he died on the cross of Calvary, the blood that was shed from the perfect sacrifice makes it so that my sin can be taken away, so that your sin can be taken away, so that we can have fellowship with God. But the only way that happens isn't because of God doing that for us. It is also us accepting God's offer to have his blood take away our sin. That's entering into the, the forever covenant. All people who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ have entered into the forever covenant. They have come to the place of recognizing that their sins have separated them from God. So they repent. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to go towards God, not away from God. They confess him as Lord and Savior. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and then they say, you know, and I want to be one with, the, with God, and I want the world to know I am one with God and they are immersed for the forgiveness of their sins and receive God's Holy Spirit. And what I need to say about baptism is just this. Baptism in water is a biblical principle. It is the outward demonstration of an inward happening. Let me say that again. It's the outward demonstration of an inward happening. Now, can you have the outward demonstration without the inward happening? Absolutely, because it's just something physical. There's got to be that commitment relationship to where I say, the Lord is going to be the boss of my life for the rest of my life. I commit my life to be his slave, his servant. I give my life. To, uh, that's got to be there in order to be in the forever covenant. Jesus Christ provided the way by dying on the cross of Calvary that by his blood that was shed, we could have a relationship to God. But it requires us on our part to make the decision to make the choice of giving control of our life, giving our very life, all of our desires, wants, and wishes, to give that to Him. And when we do give that to Him, then we can have fellowship with God. Because Jesus Christ provided the way for you and a high to have that very thing. Book Philippians, the second chapter, the first two verses. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit fellowship of the Spirit, 
if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded and having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, how, how does that work? Uh, you, you know, uh, what's your favorite color? Uh, and, well, that's probably not mine. Uh, and what's your favorite food? Well, that's probably not mine either. Uh, and, and what's your favorite football team? Well, it's probably not mine either. And, and so how do, you, how do you get to the place of being of one mind? Well, I don't think he's ever called us to be of one mind concerning opinion. I don't think he's ever called us to be of one mind concerning earthly things. What he's asked us to be of one mind about is eternity, relationship to God. What he has revealed in his word about who he is and what he wants from us and for us, that's the thing that we need to be of one mind about. Not how many cups we have on, in communion, not how many pieces of bread we have in communion. Those are the physical things. He wants us to be of one mind, and that is to love him and to love others as we love ourselves. That is what he left us to be of one mind about. And so it becomes a spiritual thing. Did you realize that most everything in the Scripture that talks about physical things also has a spiritual side to it? It's almost as if we live in two worlds. We live in a physical world, but the physical world is just giving us a mirror image of what's in the spiritual world. And so when you took that little piece of bread today and that little glass of juice, it was something happening on the inside of you that was being demonstrated in the physical thing that you, you partook of, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and the celebration of his life. So there had to be something happening inwardly for you. Otherwise, it was just a little piece of uh, uh, bread that didn't have any leaven in it and no salt and just a little glass of Welch's grape juice. And you had a small snack before you get to the real thing after this service. But what he is saying to us very plainly is that we have fellowship with Jesus Christ and we have fellowship with the Spirit. See, isn't that what he said in Acts 2.38? Uh, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can receive the gift of the Spirit. Having fellowship with the Spirit, then, is the desire that you and I have. Now, we were talking this last week, and I don't remember the context of it, but people were talking about Moses, and they were talking about Abraham and Joseph, you know, the, the, the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament, and, and how they're so much different than we are because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. You and I have the Holy Spirit, and they were heroes of the faith because they lived by commitment. They made their commitment to God, and then they lived by it. And that made them heroes of the faith. You and I should be different from them. We should be more than they, because we have the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. Because God's Holy Spirit can give us new eyes to see, new ears to hear, so that we can go past the things of the world and get to the things that are really important, the things that are spiritual, the things that, that draw us into that relationship to God. When, when they talk about heaven, <clears throat> you know, and they, they talk about bodies and that sort of thing, and, and we're all wanting to get new bodies and, and have our aches and pains go away and, and, that, and that sort of thing. You know, the book of Revelation is best understood if you look at the physical things that are there as spiritual. Do you really think there's going to be a physical battle of Armageddon? And, and that that's what the book of Revelation is really talking about? Or do you think the book of Revelation is taking physical things and saying, spiritually, there's another side to this. Spiritually, there's another side to this. And so the spirit then becomes very important in my life and in your life. Because if I don't have the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit, I'm still going to try to do things in a physical way. Because that's the world that I came out of. And so fellowship with the Spirit is very essential. In the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 9, and I, I started with verse 9 because I just like this passage. I want you to think about it. I has not seen, nor ear heard, and this is a quote from the book of Isaiah, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. If that doesn't make you want to go to heaven, I don't know what will. Because you take your, your, your strongest and your best imagination uh, and, and then throw it away. 
because it doesn't even come close to what God has prepared for those who love him, who have entered into a relationship to him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, through his spirit. And you've heard me say this repeatedly through the years. When you're talking to somebody and they say, I just don't understand the Bible, and, and, uh, and you say to them, well, what translation are you using? Well, my grandma gave me a King James version of the Bible. Well, that's the reason you can't understand the Bible, because you need to have it in a modern language version. You need to have it in the message. You need to have it in the NIV. You need to have it in some modern translation. By the way, I think people study harder when they use the King James Version because truly you don't understand what it's talking about. And so you got to dig a little bit farther, a little bit deeper. And, and when you memorize things, it's easier to memorize in King James English than it is in modern day language. And, and if you hear somebody talking and they're quoting a verse and it's in King James, you know that it's in King James because they're talking about thus and, and its and us's. And you know it's from the King James because you don't understand it. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. How can I know what's going on in my life? Mary Alice uh, was talking about uh, wanting to have her work double-checked. And Wayne said, well, why, why don't you uh, double-check your work? Mary Alice said, because I'll just make the same mistake twice. Think about it. Who would deliberately make a mistake the first time? Because we think it's right, we read over it, and it looks right because we wrote it that way. And yet for you and I, there's parts of my life that need to change. And I'm not smart enough to see that. There's got to be some source outside of me that says to me that uh, something needs to change in your life. The Spirit searches the deep things of God. The Spirit goes to the very heart and the very core of you and I and reveals to us what God wants to change. Conviction always has to come to the issue of change. If I'm going to be convicted and I'm going to respond to the conviction, I must change. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man that is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. What, what a beautiful picture. Uh, I can't know the things of God. Uh, I, I can have my Bible, and I can read my Bible, and I can understand the English words there. And, and with my human mind, I can even begin to formulate a plan of how to put it into practice. I can talk about what the words mean, and, and I can go about doing it. But it's on the human level, not on the spiritual level. And God doesn't want us to do warfare on the physical level. He wants us to do warfare on the spiritual level. And in order for that to happen, I have to have a relationship to God's Holy Spirit. So I'm created for a relationship to God, and, and, and sin separates me from God. So Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that by his death and the blood that was shed there, sins can be forgiven so I can come back into a right relationship to God and have the indwelling, the fellowship of God's Spirit within me. So in all of that, then that brings us to another conclusion about fellowship. And it's, and it's like this, you know, as, as I've already mentioned, uh, the Denver Broncos fans have a relationship to each other because Denver won. Two years ago, they didn't have a fellowship with one another because who wants to get a bunch of losers together and, and talk about your loss and make each other feel better? Uh, that's just not normal. That's just not right. So they don't have a relationship to one another unless Denver wins. You and I have a relationship to one another because Jesus Christ won. And that relationship to each other is founded first on our relationship to him. I want you to think about it for just a moment. Uh, you, you've, you've went to one church and you've went to another church. If, if you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and you were baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you received God's Holy Spirit, and then you went to another church, uh, didn't they suggest that you transfer membership to that church? Transfer membership from one physical church to a, another physical church? I have to tell you this. If you have a commitment relationship to Jesus Christ, you are already a member of the church of Jesus Christ. 
All you can do is transfer your fellowship. You can't transfer your membership because you're a member of the church because of your relationship to Jesus Christ. However, because you're a member of a church doesn't make you a member of Jesus Christ. The reverse does not work. And you can have a relationship to the church. You can have a, a membership in a church uh, that does not make you a Christian because the only thing that makes you a Christian is the blood of Jesus Christ taking away your sin and your commitment, covenant relationship to him. And then that's what makes us have a relationship to one another. In 1 John, the first chapter, verse 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship, common, having him in common, with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, this is our relationship to him, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, that's the picture, and that's what happens when churches get to the place to where uh, they have disagreements and, 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 and they don't like this that's going on, and they, they have sides and, and they divide. Because Jesus Christ is no longer at the place that he needs to be in their lives. It has become about me and thee, and we, we, we get together with me and thee, and we build up our sides, and we have our little war. It says, if you walk in the light, if you have a relationship to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is taking away your sin, then you have fellowship with other people, other Christians as well. So, in the book First John, this is a, a, a passage that you can get from the first for the fifth chapters of First John. If you want to know how much you love God, take a look at how much you love the person you like the least. Let me say that again. If you want to know of your love relationship to God, take a look at how much you love the person you like the least. Well, how can I say that? Because that's what Jesus Christ said. That's what he gave to us by his spirit all the way through the New Testament. That's what he gave John that he might pen to us. How can you say that you love God while you hate his creation? Because I'm created in the image of God, you're created in the image of God, and what God wants is for us to have fellowship with one another. If I have fellowship with him, then I need to have fellowship with others from him. The church, fellowship. And so, purpose of care groups is just so that people can get together and get to know one another, have fellowship with Jesus Christ, and have fellowship with one another because our common bond is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ won once and for all. That will never change. Denver may win next year. They may not. And that's going to change one way or the other. Uh, we might have the same quarterback next year. Maybe not have the same quarterback. Everything changes in the world, but nothing changes in the Lord. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if that is what brings us to this place, that must remain as the foundation of our relationship to the church, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Would you pray with me, please? God, thank you for the, the time that we have each and every Lord's Day to gather together to celebrate you, to celebrate your life, your life in us, your life with each other. So may your spirit be at work to cause us to yield more of ourselves to you, that there could be less of us and more of you in each and every one of us.